ago, he's become the country's best-known policeman. With the police under greater scrutiny than ever before, his job is to guide the Metropolitan Police into the 21st century. That was crack and uh, firearms related crime in Brixton. At a time when the crime rate is at the top of the political agenda and many feel the streets of London are no longer safe, the job of Commissioner of Police of the Metropolis is one of the most sensitive in the country. As far as I'm aware, that's the first time that sort of automatic weapon has been used against Isn't us in London. Yes. Sir Paul Condon runs an organisation of 45,000 police and civil staff with an annual budget of £1.9 billion, equal in size to almost any company in the United Kingdom. When Sir Robert Peel, the Home Secretary, founded the Metropolitan Police in 1829, there were just 3,000 police officers. In some ways, it is perhaps easier to be Commissioner now than in the past. Um, Certainly London at the turn of the century and late Victorian times uh, was a very violent city. Um, huge no-go areas, um, people um, afraid of footpads and uh, highwaymen and all sorts of things. So, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's all relative. It's 25 years since Sir Paul was a PC on the beat in the East End of London. To avoid losing touch with his officers, he regularly visits police stations. Today, it's Brixton. By definition, you are remote from the, the trials and tribulations, the successes and failures of actually being at a police station. I'm not policing with them day to day. I'm not on the streets with them when they're rolling around with prisoners. I'm not with them when they're facing violence. And, and so um, I, it would be naive to pretend that there is a, a closeness. I need to understand. I need to, to share their anxieties to know what's going on. Brixton is one of the most difficult divisions in London to police. The riots of the early 1980s left a deep scar. At times, the police station itself was threatened, and relationships between the police and the community reached an all-time low. A lot has changed since those days. Community leaders and police have worked hard to repair the damage, and the atmosphere is more relaxed. It seemed to have happened over the long weekend. No sign century anywhere. No, not at all. However, many of the problems of the inner city in Brixton in the 1990s remain. May I help you? The drug squad you need. Yes, would you hold, please? Today, the superintendent in charge is Peter Clark. Good afternoon, Commissioner. The men and women who work here daily uh, face immense physical challenges and, and threats to their safety. Tragically, nearby here, PC. Patrick Dunn was, was, was killed less than two years ago. Two of our own officers here were shot and very seriously wounded last year. Far too often in finding that unarmed officers are coming up against determined armed criminals. From ITN headquarters, the early evening news with John Suchet. One of the two police constables shot last night in South London has described how he lay on the ground waiting for the gunman to finish him off. The first thing was I knew Simon was quite bad um, for the way he screamed, so I tried to get to him. Uh, but the pain was, was too bad. Sir Paul's first meeting was with colleagues of the two wounded officers. Hello there. This is David Palmer, so the sergeant. Mm -hmm. There are only two sorts of risks you're likely to face out on the street. The ones that you can see are a danger, and yes. the ones we just don't know. I think you're entitled to find that if people in this area are carrying guns and knives unlawfully, if caught and convicted, they should be facing 
very tough sentences. Unfortunately, it's come to the situation now where so many firearms are available and they are being used and they are starting to be used against police officers, as we know from last year at this sure. station. And we need to have protection. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, that, that comes down to having a firearm. A baton doesn't help when you're up against a gun. The main news so far today, tributes are paid to the policeman killed in a London street. PC Dunn and a civilian were shot dead by three gunmen who are said to have laughed as they ran from the scene. The murders have brought fresh calls for Britain's police to be armed. In October 1993, the Commissioner attended the funeral of PC Patrick Dunn. Since 1990, seven police officers have been killed and over 50,000 injured on duty. Three times as Commissioner I've had those phone calls that you never want to get, which tell you that a colleague has been uh, fatally wounded. Um, and part of me goes with them because as Commissioner, I feel responsible. I carry the burden on behalf of the whole of the Met for, for their safety. So it affects us all. Lima 3. Lima 3, please. I think to be a police officer now, anywhere in this country, you are at more risk of violence than any time in, in, in the past. Get off. Don't bait. Certainly criminals are prepared to act violently towards the police in a way which um, I find very disturbing. Just keep your head where it is, dear. She was obviously under the influence of alcohol. And that's the problem when you're dealing with people that have been drinking. You just never, ever know what they're going to do. One minute they can be talking to you really quite happily, quite calm, and the next minute you're lit, like we were doing there, rolling around on the floor with her. And that is a real danger in dealing with people like that that have been drinking. The shooting of two unarmed police officers in Brixton in March 1994 brought about an urgent rethink of protective gear. Really, we've had three things in the last year. We've had the, um, the bulletproof vests, the baton, this is actually one of the shorter ones. I think that's a 22-inch baton. And the other bit, uh, the new style handcuffs, quick cuffs or speed cuffs. Just by bashing against someone's wrist, it spins around very quickly. And within seconds, you've got the control you need over someone by, by bending their wrist around, whatever. They then do what you want them to do. Yeah. When something does happen, it, uh, it happens on quite a big scale, whether it's... Um, domestic problems or really anything can get magnified. What can be minor incidents out in the street, especially around the town centre, you get people, other people who don't know anything about it, just coming out to see what's going on and then sometimes joining in, trying to cause trouble and just, just generally escalating the incident. We've been calling by the market inspector because yeah. somebody's street trading and won't go away. Whether the officer on the beat should be armed as a matter of routine is one of the most pressing questions facing police in Britain today. The level of violence which you actually come across on the street involving firearms, um, I think, is quite unprecedented. Would you argue for permanent issue of firearms to all officers? I mean, what, what about the guy or the girl who perhaps is one of the most unsuitable people at the Nick to carry a gun? How would you feel about them wearing a gun? And I think what we need to say to people is, first of all, do you want to be an officer who wants to be armed? And if they do, then they need to go through the necessary selection procedures. Although around at Brixton now we have an ARV, which is uh, positioned just on our ground. Still, if you have to wait five, ten minutes for, for that to arrive, sure. that's far too long. Uh, and we should have the option of carrying guns. In every jurisdiction in the world, you will have what they call blue-on-blue -blue accidents. Officers shooting each other and themselves by accident. We know that police officers have their guns taken off them and they get shot with their own guns. We know that if police officers have got access to guns freely, then sadly, the number of suicides involving guns goes up. We don't know what it would do to criminals. If they knew that every police officer was carrying a gun, that might influence how they react and what they take with them to commit crime. Is it the Volvo? We've got one. Yeah, I've already booked it out. The number of armed response vehicles, known as ARVs, has recently been increased 
to cope with a rise in armed crime. Up to 14 vehicles with crews trained in a range of weapons now patrol the streets of London. There's a feeling here too that eventually all officers will be armed. Yeah, I think it's inevitable that uh, the way it's going at the moment, the escalation of the number of police officers just being shot and the number of firearms being used, I can see, sadly, that all police officers eventually will be armed. Once we stop being an unarmed service, we will lose something, a bit of the character of the, of the police force. I mean, we all like the traditions of, of being a bobby, really. Once we become an armed service, that will go. An abandoned call made from a male stated there was a male in a petrol station armed with a gun. My own view is that I have no doubt we will be arming more and more police officers as time goes by, but in a controlled way, in a way that they are specially selected, specially trained, are monitored, uh, can handle the situation. Um, so yes, more police officers carrying guns, but I don't believe we're at a point yet where I should be arguing that every police officer should carry a gun every time they're on duty. From the uniform branch, the commissioner moved to the CID. These guys were people involved in our proactivity, just a sample of them, obviously, uh, with various team leaders and one or two of the main players involved. Well, I'm the detective sergeant on the crime squad. We're 100% uh, robbery um, proactive, out on the streets, arresting robbers, uh, touring victims round yep. to attempt to identify the suspects and looking after the victims afterwards. Street robberies went up by uh, several thousand last year, and although, relatively speaking, they are a small number, we're not prepared to tolerate an increase, and so we have set robbery as one of our priorities. Detective Sergeant Roger North heads a team of plainclothes officers in unmarked cars who discreetly watch vulnerable pedestrians. Operation Eagle Eye. People being held up in the street, snatches of handbags, um, people being attacked with knives and, uh, and cash stolen. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here she comes, this lady here. Got three handbags. One of those went on the checkbook, didn't it? This alleyway here, she's coming up to on the left. We've had a few people duck out of there, snatch the bags and run back down the alleyway. When a robbery has occurred, if it's happened recently, we uh, take the details and if they can still identify the suspect, we uh, tour them around the area um, to attempt to identify the suspect if he's still around. Did he have a blue shirt, did he? Yes. Did he see the blue shirt? And try and keep your eyes peeled because we're not allowed to uh, direct you in any way. You yes. Have to, um, make your own observation. Did you have a knife at all? You did. That's it. Flick knife. You saw it, yeah? Pulled it, yeah. How yeah. do you know it was a flick knife? Well, it out. Right. Nice, nice, okay. When he demanded the money, what was the, what was the words he used? Basically, oh, I told him, how do I know you're not just coming in? He goes, well, I'm not coming to your house, doesn't matter. Then he pulled his knife and says, give me all your money and whatever you got. I'm going to start searching my coat. Twenty-two percent of the population of Brixton is black. In 1994, of people stopped and searched in that area, 57 percent were black. Although the relationship between the black community and the police is improving, it is at times still tense. The pattern of stopping and searching tends to reflect um, what crime reports and intelligence is revealing to us in different parts of London. So in some parts of London, a high number of young black men feature in our stopping and searching. Now that's a challenge, not just to me as police commissioner, not just to the people running the relevant police stations, but to the whole community. How are we going to encourage those young people um, away from a criminal lifestyle? No justice! No peace! A political row erupted in July of this year when Sir Paul wrote to a cross-section of community leaders in London asking them to a meeting to discuss the connection between street robberies and young, unemployed black people. Opinion was divided along fairly predictable lines and the Home Secretary supported the Commissioner. Although there were protests outside Scotland Yard on the day of the meeting, those who attended said it was useful. Short term, I'm, I'm tasked with actually doing something about those street robberies, and that brings with it a whole range of tensions and challenges. Over 
of young black men in London are unemployed. Um, many of them feel uh, discriminated against, threatened, challenged. Um, if you are looking for some focus for your hurt, for your anxiety, for your concern as a young black person, and you look to the establishment authority in general, well, the very visible manifestation of that is the police service. So we shouldn't be surprised if there is a tension between particularly um, young black men um, and police officers. Of course things go wrong. There, will, there are millions of contacts between the police and the public every year. Some of those interactions will go wrong. Very, very rarely will the police act badly. Um, but when they do, those, those uh, instances of bad behaviour must be exposed and dealt with. And we do our best to deal with them. Could I just get your son's name, please? Mike Potter has been a police constable for three years. He understands better than most white officers okay. the culture of young black men. Individually, these kids or these youngsters, they're not a problem at all. It's just that when you get them within their groups, they can be a little more of a handful than they should be. And unfortunately, often you get a peer pressure and they often get into things which are worse than they actually imagine until it's too late. To bridge the gap between police and ethnic minorities, the Met has for many years tried to recruit officers from those communities. But with only 730 officers from ethnic minorities out of a total of 28,000, so far the results have been disappointing. I am told by people whose judgment I trust and respect um, from within the ethnic community, if you're from an Asian background and you come into policing, you will disappoint your families and friends. It is seen as a low status profession. Um, your family would rather you were a doctor, solicitor, accountant, teacher, almost anything rather than a policeman. If you're from an Afro-Caribbean background, your friends may accuse you of having sold out. So it's a tough challenge from, for someone from an ethnic background to come into policing. But we're not prepared to do daft artificial things just to inflate the numbers for the sake of it. They've got to be people who are suitable to come into policing, who are prepared for the rigours of policing, and will stay with us. Unfortunately, you, you still do have this sort of like this sad mentality. It's almost like living in a barrel of crabs, where as soon as you're trying to claw your way out um, and get yourself a half reasonable job, I, I see nothing wrong with the police force, um, that someone decides that they want to pull you back in. They say, this job isn't for you. You're supporting, what are you supporting, in fact? You're supporting the white man. I think a lot of it goes back down to, possibly down to the days of slavery, sadly, and um, which is quite understandable. There is nothing worse and nothing more humiliating for a black man to be put back into shackles. And it's certainly one of those things, when I'm considering putting handcuffs on someone, I do bear in mind. In areas like Brixton, there are particular pressures on a black officer. If you go up and stop someone, um, then sometimes I have actually had it where black people have turned around to me and said, you're only stopping me because I'm black. Some people, because they see young, young blacks, they'll see the uniform, a black man in the uniform, and they'll instantly think traitor, which is a little bit of a shame. A lot of black officers have actually um, left areas which are very black, for example, Brixton, uh, Peckham, um, uh, to Tottenham, mainly because they get such a hard time out there. But at the end of the day, I think um, after about two or three months, your skin begins to wear quite thick, and it, it tends to be water off a duck's back. Not all the problems have come from outside the police. Police officers are not robots, they're not automatons. They're drawn from society. They're drawn from a society that has likes and dislikes, that has prejudices. Um, now, we screen out the people with the worst attitude. We, we attempt to only take suitable people into policing. Um, occasionally, a small number let us down. Um, and we try to deal with them. So we will never totally eradicate corruption. We will never totally eradicate racism. 
Um, but I would proudly put our record against any other public service in the country. Perhaps the most sensitive situation Sir Paul has had to handle as commissioner was the death of Joy Gardner when she was arrested by the alien deportation squad. At a press conference called on the day that Joy Gardner died, Sir Paul announced the suspension of the three arresting officers and appealed for calm. I can understand the anger, I can understand the distress, in Hornsey, on the streets, in the estates, as people try to come to terms with what has happened. By acting quickly, Sir Paul defused a potentially explosive incident, although many police officers felt their colleagues had been unfairly treated. They were later cleared of charges of manslaughter. I would love a cup of tea, right. I've got virtually no voice left. Right, but there's one on its way. It's the Commissioner's next system. meeting was with officers responsible for liaison with the public. It's a two-way process. We're involved in a running programme. We're building on the success of the frontline police officers right there on the street. There's long been a debate among senior police officers about how much time should be devoted to targeting crime and how much to building relationships with the community. By and large, I think the mix we've got feels about right. Police officers don't want to just um, have a siege mentality where the only time they have contact with the public is in times of danger or stress or crime. Part of the relationship is building up crime prevention advice helping set up Neighbourhood Watch, um, encouraging citizenship with young people. There's a whole range of activity which superficially may not look as if it's pure police work, but it certainly, I think, contributes to confidence in policing and the partnership between police and the public. Right, so this is the, going to be the music room. And we've got one of the youth actually doing the graffiti on it. Right. And we gave him a brief which said, no violent images, nothing negative, it's all got to be positive stuff. And this is a, the, the setting up of this room was a result of the survey we did, because on the estate we went around and spoke to everybody on the estate, the Tenants Association, and we asked them what they wanted us to provide, and then we asked them about you. And overwhelmingly, they want to see more uniform patrols around. Overwhelmingly, they don't want to see plain clothes. They want to see a symbol of somebody yeah. in force. They want to see the symbol of the law. Hello, sir. <laughs> the image of the police can't always be that of the friendly Bobby. In tough inner city areas like Brixton, the crime level is high, and it's the police who have to deal with it. Number three, I'll leave four and see. We live in fairly rancorous times. Maybe it's sort of an end of century feel where we, I think there is a sort of, um, we, want, we live in a society where someone has to be f to blame for everything. Natural disasters, disasters, um, lack of cohesion. There is desire to have someone to blame. And if, if crime is going up, uh, as it has been on some occasions, then uh, the obvious target to blame are the police service. I can draw a distinction between a sort of media commentary and a media perception and what the actual public feel about policing. When, when Londoners are asked, who do you trust? Then they trust their police officers. Uh, I think only doctors ah. had a higher rating than the police service in London. Sorry? Well, I, I think this side. Yeah, no. well, I, I think he's gone upstairs. The headquarters of the Metropolitan Police is an anonymous office block in Victoria, New Scotland Yard. I can go anywhere in the world and do so and say Scotland Yard, it means something. It, um, it means British policing, it means a standard of excellence.